Okay, great. Thank you, Joachim, and thanks everyone for coming. Uh, I'm Yanjun Han from Stanford WE, and today I'm going to talk about the profile maximum likelihood, as well as optimality and limitations in the high accuracy regime. This is a joint work with my collaborator, Kiran Shuyaga from Stanford MS and E, and we are also very grateful to professors Jadel Acharya from Cornell ECE, Mozilla Charika, Aaron Sisbert, both from Stanford CS, and my advisor, Saha Weissman from Stanford WE, for the, their great support on this work. So, before introducing what is the profile maximum likelihood, let's begin with the definition of the profile for discrete samples. So given the samples x1 to xn, the profile of the samples is simply a summary statistic and is an n-dimensional vector phi1 to phi n, where phi i denotes the number of domain elements appearing exactly i times in the sample. For example, let's assume that consider the case where the samples are a, b, a, a, c, then the symbol A appears three times in the samples, while symbols B and C both appear once in the sample. So there are two domain elements appearing once in the sample, and one domain element appear three times in the sample. So the profile for this sample, for these observations will be 20100 in that example. Equivalently, the profile could also be treated as the histogram of the histogram. For example, in the above scenario, the histogram is 311 because symbol A appears three times and symbols B and C both appear once. And then the histogram for this histogram vector would, would, would be the case that the symbol one appears two times and the symbol three appears once. So this again will also give us the same profile distribution, the same profile. So in other words, the main difference between the profile and the histogram is that the profile discards all the labeling information. For example, in histogram, we know that symbol A appears three times, but in the profile, we just discard that information and we only know that there is only one symbol appearing three times, but we don't know which symbol is that. Okay, after introducing what's the profile, now we are ready to define what is the profile maximum likelihood or PML in short. The notion of PML was introduced by Olitsky et al. in 2004, which is an extension of the classical maximum likelihood estimator, and it defined to be the discrete distribution which maximizes the likelihood of a given profile. So mathematically, the P after observing a sample with profile phi, the PML distribution associated with the phi is nothing but the dis probability distribution which maximizes the probability of observing phi when the true distribution for the samples are RID drawn from some distribution P. So here, the probability notation just denotes the probability of observing a given profile phi under, uh, for when the samples are drawn from an RID distribution P. And here, MK denotes the set of all discrete distributions with support size K. Okay, maybe it's easier to see through the previous example where there are two symbols appearing once and one symbol appearing three times. In this scenario, the depending on which symbol appearing three times, the, the definition of PML will solve the following mathematician problem, as the, which is the sum of different probabilities, where each term just corresponds to the scenario where different symbols appear three times in this example. For example, the first term just means that, okay, it is possible that the first symbol appears three times. The second term means that, okay, maybe the second symbol appears three times. And the PML de definition is just to man maximize the total probability of observing such a profile. And, okay, let's see, take a look at more PML examples. For example, when the observations are ABA, well, the sample size is three and the support size is two, that it will have a binary distributions. Then the empirical estimate will assign probability two-thirds to symbol A and one-third to symbol B. This is just the empirical average. And however, the PML estimate in this scenario will be half-half. So meaning that the uniform distribution actually gives the highest likelihood of observing such a profile pattern. And as another example, let's assume that we have an additional observation C here. Now we have four samples and assume that we know that the support size of this distribution is actually five. In reality, actually, we do not need to know the support size and the PML actually solves the problem with, among all possible support sizes. 
But for simplicity, we just assume that the support size is unknown throughout this work. And for this example, the empirical estimate will assign probability one half to symbol A, probability one fourth to symbol B and C, and zero probability to the rest of them. However, it turns out that the PML estimate for this example is still the uniform distribution over all five different elements. So still very different from the empirical estimate. And this distribution gives the highest likelihood of observing such a profile. Yeah, so apart from these simple examples where we could find out the explicit expression of the PML, we need to remark that it is typically very hard to compute or even approximately compute the PML in general. The main reason is that if we take a look at, at the objective function we'd like to maximize, then each term is a multivariate polynomial in the parameter of the p1 to pk. So each term is actually non-convex. And secondly, the sum is over exponentially many terms. So this problem is a highly non-convex optimization problem involving exponentially many terms. And so it's very hard to solve in general. And over the years, there has been several heuristic algorithms to approximately compute the PML. But it was not until very recently that people found provably polynomial time approximate algorithms for the computation of PML. Now, given that the PML is so hard, so hard or so non-trivial to compute, and it seems so unnatural because it is very different from the empirical distribution, then why do people care about the PML? The main application of the PML is actually on the symmetric function estimation, which we will slightly switch our gale and focus on it for now. So what is the problem of the symmetric function estimation? The problem is as follows. Suppose the learner has n ID observations x1 to xn drawn from a discrete but unknown distribution with support size k, and the learner aims to estimate the quantity written as a form of a sum of sum of function f applied to each pi for a given function f. For such a quantity, we will call this a functional of the distribution. And in this example case, yeah, we n will denote the sample size and k will denote the support size. These are two important parameters in this scenario. And for example, when f of x equals to minus x log of x, then the functional becomes a Shannon entropy. And when f of x equals to indicator function of x not equal to zero, then this quantity becomes the support size. And estimating such functionals have various applications in lots of different fields like genetics, image processing, computer vision, and so on. And this problem can also be readily generalized to general non-symmetric or multivariate or even non-parametric functionals. So to solve this problem, there has been a rich line of research in the past decade on uh, how to find out what is the optimal estimator for each of the functional. Let's, let's consider, so maybe the most natural estimator for functional estimation is that we just plug in the empirical distribution. That is the PN hat is the empirical distribution and then we just plug in the, the expression of a PN hat into the functional f. However, the main issue is that there is a phenomenon known as the effective sample size enlargement that claims that Actually, the performance of the minimax optimal estimator with n samples is essentially the same performance of the MLE or the plug-in approach with n times log n samples. So this phenomenon means that the plug-in approach is strictly suboptimal with a, pr a provable logarithmic gap. And this phenomenon is verified in lots of functionals, especially non-smooth functionals in recent literature, such as the Shannon entropy, J entropy, distance to uniformity, and also including some bivariate functionals like KL or TV divergence, divergences, or the, even some non-parametric non-smooth functionals. So in this line of research, yeah, typically a target functional is first given to the people, and then people figure out what is the optimal way to estimate such a functional. So we call this approach as an ad hoc estimation. Because, or a non-adaptive estimation because the estimation procedure will depend on the functional. Another line, recent line of research, focus on a different problem called adaptive estimation or universal estimation. The target is to find a single distribution estimator p hat, such that plugging, we hope that we plug in p hat into the target functional will be universally optimal for many functionals. As a pictorial illustration, so the learner only knows the 
observations from x1 to xn, based on which the learner computes an estimate of p hat for the sample. And when we go to the functional estimation problem, suppose we have several functionals, then the learner just plug in the same p hat into those functionals and hope that the resulting estimators are optimal for the respective tasks. A natural question is that, okay, is that too good to be true? Know that actually we have good reasons to be suspicious. The first reason is that possibly the most natural estimator one could think of is to choose p hat to be the empirical estimator. But just now we have shown that, that the plugging approach of the MLE is actually strictly suboptimal. So it, it is not optimal. And the second reason is that even for estim the estimation of a single functional, typically the estimation approach is very complicated. So it might be seem impossible that such an easy plugging approach will do the job universally for many functionals. The surprising answer is actually no. What's even more surprising is that there exists actually more than one adaptive approach to do so. Okay, the first approach is called the local mode matching or LMA in short was proposed in 2018. So the main result is that there exists a single estimator p hat efficiently computable, which achieves the optimal sample complexity for a large class of symmetric functionals whenever the accuracy level epsilon is much greater than the order n to the power minus one third. Yeah, in particular, yeah, that estimator is also a minimax optimal estimator for the sorted distribution. That is the last function we measure the distance between two distributions is the sorted L1 distance. And also this problem is strictly easier than estimating the unsorted distributions. So this estimator is built on a very explicit idea of moment matching in local intervals as the name suggests. So this is a first estimator or adaptive approach to, do, to achieve that. Then what is the second approach? You may, as you may correctly guess, it should be the PML. Yeah, but the main challenge for the PML is that after its invention in 2004, very few statistical properties of a PML could be said. Perhaps possibly except for its defining property that the PML maximizes the likelihood of the profile. Yeah, the main reason is that the PML is so hard to compute and it does not admit the explicit, explicit form solutions or even some explicit first order approximations. A recent breakthrough was obtained in 2017 by Achaya, Das, Olitsky, and Suresh, that it, which showed the competitive analysis of the PML. So specifically, the result says the follows, following. Suppose there exists some another estimator F hat such that the worst case probability of x pad being epsilon far from the truth is delta. Then for the PML plug-in approach, the worst case probability of that approach being two epsilon far from the truth is at most the error probability delta times a competitive factor, which is e to the power three root n. So in other words, the performance of the PML plug-in approach is competitive to all possible other approaches, including the optimal one, with an competitive factor e to the three root n. You may wonder, maybe this competitive factor is very large because it is at least a super polynomial. But the issue here is that the tail probability on the right hand side typically has a sub Gaussian tail, meaning that it is typically of the order e to the power minus n epsilon squared when n exceeds the sample complexity of achieving error epsilon. So when epsilon is greater than n to the power of minus one quarter, then actually the probability in the left hand side will be still be exponentially small. So the PML plugging approach will attain the rate optimal sample complexity when the accuracy parameter epsilon is much greater than n to the power of minus one quarter. So basically this result shows the optimality guarantee of the PML in the low accuracy regime, meaning that the accuracy parameter need to be at least n to the minus one fourth. Okay, let's take a summary of these three approaches. So for the ad hoc approach, it can achieve the fully optimality whenever epsilon is greater than one by root n, that is the parametric rate, and the computational complexity is almost linear. Yeah, and it can deal with asymmetric functionals. The issue for ad hoc approaches is that it first, it depends on the specific functional. Second, it typically requires lots of parameter tuning in the algorithm. 
Then how about the local moment matching? Yeah, it is optimal when epsilon is much greater than n to the power of minus one third. And there is a polynomial time algorithm to compute that parameter. The advantage of that it is, is that it is functional independent, although it cannot deal with asymmetric functional and also requires a lot of parameter tuning in the algorithm. Then how about the PML? The, the optimality guarantee of the PML holds in an even more restricted regime. That is, epsilon is much greater than n to the minus one quarter. And there exists a polynomial time algorithm to approximately compute the PML. But the advantage of PML is that it is functional independent and it is, it is free of parameter tuning. And the important open question asked by the previous author is that, is the requirement epsilon much greater than n to the minus one fourth for PML an artifact of analysis or a fundamental limitation of the PML? So there could be two possibilities. Let's say PML could be optimal when for the fully optimal for the widest range where epsilon much greater than one by root n, the parametric rate. And this is because that people cannot show that uh, so far. It could also be the case that, okay, epsilon great, much greater than n to the minus one fourth is a fundamental limitation of the PML. While beyond, we, beyond this accuracy level, the PML will fail to be optimal. So this is the main question we'd like to answer in this talk. And our, the main result of this talk is that the PML is optimal if and only if epsilon is much greater than n to the minus one third. So the answer is neither one by root n nor n to the minus one four quarter, but is n to the power minus one third. So in other words, we provide a tight analysis of PML First, we show that a high accuracy of the melody of the PML, meaning that the PML remains optimal for a higher accuracy level up to n to the minus one third. On the other hand, we also prove a novel limitation of the PML. That is, PML will fail to be optimal when the accuracy range goes beyond that threshold. So here are our main theorems stated in an informal way. So our first theorem is that the PML of plug-in approach will be competitive against all estimators with a competitive factor like e to the power n to the one third plus a little o one constant. So this is so compared with the previous competitive factor e to the root n power, then yeah, this is an improvement from, from on the exponent from root n to n to the one third. So this result will imply the optimality of the PML when the accurate parameter epsilon is much greater than n to the minus one third. And our second theorem yeah, concerns about the limitation. That is, when epsilon is far smaller than n to the minus one third, not only the PML plug-in approach, but also any general adaptive approaches will fail to achieve the optimal sample complexity for some one leaflet functional. This result simply says that, okay, no matter which adaptive al algorithm or estimator you give me, I could find some instance of the one dip is functional such that the non-adaptive way or the functional specific way to estimate that will be strictly better than the performance of that adaptive algorithm on that functional. So this implies that there will be a strict price of adaptation when epsilon is much smaller than n to the minus one third. And also note that this, the, the price of adaptation will not occur when epsilon is greater than n to the minus one third, because in that scenario, PML is fully optimal. But when epsilon is indeed very small, then there will be a straight price we need to pay for adaptation using any or general adaptive approaches. So this completes the introduction part and any questions so far? Okay. Maybe, yeah, maybe we could now we could move on to the first part, that is to show the upper bound or the high accuracy optimality of the PML approach. So the materials of this part could be found in the following paper available on archive. So before we, pre we present our argument, let's first review what is the idea in the paper Achaya et al. in 2017. Okay, we start with some several notations. That capital phi of n be the set of all possible profiles with sample size n, and the little phi be a particular profile. For each little phi, we also associate the PML distribution p phi 
which maximize the likelihood of such a given profile phi. And let this probability notation denotes the probability of observing phi if the true underlying distribution is P. And our technical goal is that just using only the defining property of the PML, because this is essentially the only property we know for PML, find an upper bound on the worst case probability that the PML plugin approach is too epsilon close to the, F, to the truth, given an estimator f hat, another estimate f hat, depending only on the profile such that the worst case error probability of f hat being epsilon far from the truth is at most some quantity delta. So finally, we will prove some upper bound on this worst case probability in terms of delta and some competitive factor. And here is the idea in Achaya et al. in 2017 with slight modifications. So let's consider the following pictorial illustration. So each black dot represents one profile. And recall that one profile will also give rise to another the PML distribution associated with that profile. And let phi n be the set of all such profiles. And the main idea here is that we first define a set of good profile under each P. So basically, under the true distribution P, we define the good profile to be the set of profile such that the our the given estimator is epsilon close to the truth. Suppose that, yeah, okay, the blue rectangle represents a set of good profiles. Then it is clear to see that the probability of profiles in G on the P will be at least one minus delta because the error probability of the given estimator is at, low, at most a delta. Okay, so this is the definition of the good profile. And now we would like to find a good criterion on when the profile maximum likelihood, the PML, PV, will be also close to the truth. And here comes the crucial observation or the lemma that is for every profile in the good set, such that the probability of G on the PV is greater than delta, then the plugin approach of that PML distribution will be too epsilon close to the truth. So in other words, in the picture, I just plot, yeah, I let the blue dots represent the profile such that this condition holds. Then for those blue dots, the, the, pro, the PML distribution will be close to the truth. And if we take a closer look at the assumption here, this assumption typically says that the probability of the set G under the distribution PV is greater than delta. And recall that previously we showed that the probability of G under the true distribution P, not PV, but P, will be greater than one minus delta. So basically this shows that as long as some PML distribution PV puts a large total probability on the subset of G, then that pro that the PML distribution based on that profile will be good. The proof of this observation is actually quite simple. So if we apply the worst case error probability of the given estimator when the true distribution is PV, actually we, the, pro, the assumption will imply that the, there will we we exist some profile phi prime in G such that F hat will be epsilon close to the truth. Because this is mainly because that if we are, if yeah, this is not true for every phi prime in G, then the error, pro then the error probability for the given estimator will be at least the probability of the set G on the PV, which is at least the delta by the assumption. But this is a contradiction with the worst case error probability of that given estimator. So yeah, so this is true for some phi prime in G. However, by the definition of G, we also know that F hat applied to phi prime minus FP is also at most epsilon. This is exactly the definition of the good profile. Now about triangle inequality, we know that, okay, a single F hat is close to both FP and FP phi. So their difference is at most two times epsilon. So this observation just gives us a very useful criterion on deciding whether a given PML distribution is close to the truth. And now we are ready to upper bound what is the worst case error probability of the PML plugin approach. So the idea is very simple. We just enumerate all possible profiles and count the total probability of such bad profiles or just the blue dots, uh, no, the black dots in the figure. 
Okay, the block styles could be could belong to one of the following category. First, it could be outside the G, which occurs a total probability at the most the probability of a G complement under the true distribution P. And the other ones are the black dots inside G, yeah, which is essentially the sum of the probability of all such profiles B, conditionally on the fact that the probability of G under P V is at most delta. And now we only need to upper bound the probability each probability here. So yeah, recall the previous fact, the probability of G under P is at most one minus, is at least one minus delta. So the first term could be upper bounded by delta. And for the second term, we just use a naive chain of inequalities. That is, the probability of G must be at least the probability of a phi, because the phi is an element of G. And then, because the profile maximum likelihood, by definition, maximizes the likelihood of the profile. So this probability is in turn at least the probability of a profile phi under the true distribution P. So in other words, we actually could replace this guy by a much smaller quantity here. And now each, each term in the sum will be at most a delta because here we are looking at the same quantity. So this term could be further upper bounded by one plus the cardinality of the all possible profiles, which could be shown, which is shown to be upper bounded by e to the power of three root n. So here, this competitive factor e to the power of three root n is nothing but a combinatorial cardinality bound on the number of distinct profiles. So we could treat the entire argument as a typical union bound argument. Okay, that was the previous analysis in Acharya et al. in 2017. And then later, people made some effort to improve these competitive factors for in different scenarios. And there are two main approach used in the, pre, in the later work. The first approach is to propose modifications of PML such that the cardinality of a different profile would be smaller under that modification. For example, that includes a pseudo or truncated PML distribution. The main issue of this approach is that that, that PML is not the vanilla PML anymore. And also, how to do the modification will depend on the target functional, which means that that uh, this approach is not adaptive by, by, the, by our definition. The second approach could be to find the distribution dependent bounds of the effective cardinality of phi n. So basically the e to the three root n, yeah, this is a worst case upper bound on the cardinality of profiles. But under different true distributions, there are, the effective cardinality might be smaller. Yeah, this approach is taken by Ha and Oliski in 2020. Yeah, they, well, they propose a notion of profile entropy. The issue, main issue for this, prop, for this part is that the upper bound for the worst case distribution is still of the order e to the power of root n. So in terms of the minimized analysis or the worst case analysis, then the worst case analysis of the PML will still remain the same. So it is still open whether the previous analysis could be improved in general for the PML. And the main result in this part is that actually the, the imp a general improvement is possible. And we could improve the, root, the e to the power root n uh, competitive factor to an improved exponent like n to the one third plus any small constancy. So basically, yeah, it means that we just can improve the exponent in the competitive factor from root n to n to the one third plus c. And we also know that currently we will have a worse dependence on the error probability delta because the exponent one minus c will be strictly smaller than one. But this typically does not matter because delta is typically exponentially small. So raising to another exponent will not change the rate of the exponent. And this result works for approximate PML as well, where we will have a additional factor on the right-hand side on the observation property of your PML. So basically it means that once in, in reality, if we could compute an approximate TML distribution, it still works with an additional factor on the right-hand side. And the one direct corollary of that result is on the functional estimation, that is, for many symmetric functionals where a sub-Gaussian tail probability is possible, 
example, then the PML plugin approach will attain the optimal rate of sample complexity within the accuracy level epsilon much greater than n to the minus one third. So this means that we could improve the accuracy level from n to the minus one fourth to n to the minus one third. And this is why we call this, call this result a high accuracy of the magnitude result for the PML. And another more, slightly more involved result for that, for the PML is that the PML distribution itself is actually a minimized optimal estimator for the sorted the true distribution, the true distribution. Yeah, with the following quantity. So this result simply shows that even if we do not apply PML to estimate this any symmetric functional, the PML distribution itself as a discrete distribution will be a minimized estimator for the sorted true distribution in the following sense. The proof of a correlated tool is much more indirect and, and involved. And during the proof, we, also, we even obtain some side result on a pure approximation theoretic problem. So we will just defer the proof of this corollary to the full paper. And the rest of the part one will be devoted to what is a high level idea to improve the previous argument. So yeah, if we take a closer look at the previous argument, one pot potentially lose inequality might be the inequality like this. That is the probability of G is greater than probability of phi for each phi inside G. This inequality might be loose because in our, yeah, because we will conjecture that G should be much larger than phi. So yeah, so this step should be loose in, to some extent. However, if we don't know anything more about the profile PML distribution, it could be tight when p phi is essentially supported on the singleton phi, which is very like possible because p phi is the distribution that maximizes the probability of such a profile. So it could happen. And in that scenario, we will have a relationship that probability of phi under any other PML distributions, which should be close to zero. Yeah, which is, yeah, that is much smaller than the probability of phi under its PML distribution p phi. So the main idea to improve this previous argument is that we show that the last inequality will not typically hold in reality. And before that, we let's take a look at the benefit if we could show that this relationship actually fails. Specifically, let's ask the following question. What, what will change if we could have probability of phi on the p phi is approximately equal to probability of phi on the p phi prime? For any phi and phi prime, I have to say that this, yeah, this condition is unlikely to hold in practice because when phi and phi prime is very far apart from each other, then we should expect that the probability of put on the profile of phi by p phi and p phi prime should be quite different. However, if we could know that, then we are actually in a very great shape. Actually, we could show that the error probability of the PML could be as small as delta without any competitive factor. The main reason is that if the probability of G under certain P5 prime is at most delta, then we could write the probability of G as the sum of probability of each individual profiles. And then using this approximation property, then we could change the P5 prime by P phi. And Again, using the definition, defining probability of the profile maximum likelihood, we could replace p phi by p. And then we sum it up, we will arrive at the probability of g under the distribution p and, say, and find that, okay, this probability should be smaller than delta. However, this is a contradiction to the property that this, the probability of this set should be greater than minus delta. So the previous assumption cannot hold. And the total error probability of, of the PML will be at the most delta. Although, yeah, this assumption is unlikely to hold in practice, it motivates the following idea, that is, we should have an improved bound. If we could show certain continuity property of the mapping from the profile phi to the PML distribution, P of phi. The main difficulty to carry out the idea is that what is the right continuity property we should think about for this part? And this was indeed very hard for us. And after several trials, it turns out that the right continuity property is represented in the following covering lemma. So basically, 
Yeah, R and S are just the two parameters controlling different trade-offs. And the main, well, this lemma mainly claims that for there exists a smaller set C inside the total set of profiles such that the new set has a smaller cardinality. It's of the at most of the order e to the n to the r's power. Yeah, it is strictly smaller than e to the root n because r is smaller than half. And also, every profile phi could be approximated by some profile phi prime in the smaller set in the following sense. That is, for all possible subset of profiles, the probability of p phi put on s is close to the probability of p phi prime put on s by this two-sided multiplicative inequality. So here, we have two sources of approximation parameters. So the first one is that the exponent on the error probability is not exactly one. It, it is actually slightly larger than one. And also, we also have the multiplicative approximation factor written in the exponential form. And so this that coming lemma just gives us a covering property of the PML distributions and it shows that the entire set of PML distribution could be approximated by a smaller set in a proper way. And here, the parameters R and S just handle the different trade-offs. For example, R just handles the trade-off between the cardinality of the small set and the approximation exponent. And S handles the trade-off between the probability exponent here and the multiplicative exponent here. Okay, so this is a key covering lemma we will use to improve the analysis of PML. And just take a look of the application with r equal to 3 eighths and s equal to 1 eighths. So in this pictorial illustration, so again, each black dot represents one profile. And the profiles will be grouped into several groups. Yeah, actually more than two groups, but we only plot two, G1 and G2. And for each group, there will be a candidate distribution, Q, for that. That is, Q is approximately equal to the same to all profiles in that group. And the main proof idea will go as follows. So we will first move from each PML distribution, P phi, to its quantized distribution, Q1. And then we move back from Q1 to the true distribution, P. Yeah, so the first step when, where we move from P phi to Q1 is called the going down process, and the next step is called the going up process. So the going down process is actually very easy to understand because P phi and Q1 are close. So by the approximation property, we will have an upper bound of the probability of G1 on, on the Q1 by the probability of G1 on the P phi. So this is the going down process. The going up process is actually more involved. That is, yeah, how, suppose that we have an upper bound on the probability of G1 on the Q1. Then we could write it as a sum of the probability for different profiles. And because Q1 is close to every PML distribution inside this set, so we could relate Q1 by P phi. And here, the summation, know that the exponent in the summation is not exactly one. Then we need to apply Jensen's inequality to look for the lower bound, so this quantity by the sum of the probabilities and some cardinality factor. So to deal with the sum of the probability, we just use the PML definition to replace the P phi here by P. And so this guy is just the probability of G1 on the P. For the next term, actually we just use the trivial bound, uh, cardinality bound. That is the cardinality of G1 is at most the cardinality of all profiles, which is e to the power of root n. And finally, we will obtain some approximation factor like this. So this is a going up process, meaning that an upper bound on the distribution Q1 will lead to an upper bound on the distribution P. And combining these two arguments, we conclude that yeah, if we have an upper bound on the probability on the P phi, then we will also have an upper bound on the probability on the P. And because the cardinality of the small subset is at most of the order n to the three eighths, so by summing up, we know we see that the competitive factor just reduce from e to the root n to e to the factor n to the three eighths. So the exponent will improve from one, one half to three eighths. Okay, this is actually the best exponent we could obtain if we apply one layer covering. So we still need to go from three eighths to one third. 
And this could be done by applying uh, multiple stages of covering or effectively the chaining idea, which is a standard tool in probability theory. That is, instead of only consider one layer covering, we also consider a final covering of the distributions between the, P, the PML distributions and the cost covering Q1. And we can still apply the same going down process and going up process. Without the going down process, we move along PC to Q2 and then to Q1. While going up process, we just move to Q1, to Q2, and to the true distribution P. And finally, we just properly choose the parameters to, obtain, to drive the final exponent in the competitive factor from 3 eighths to 7 twentieths and all the way to 1 third. The limiting number will be 1 third. So applying multiple stages of chaining or covering, actually we could arrive at the one final one third exponent on the competitive factor. So to summarize, in part one, we show that the competitive factor of the PML could be improved from root e to the root n to e to the n to the one third. And the accurate threshold from PML is improved from epsilon much greater than n to the minus one quarter and epsilon greater than n to the, n to the minus one third. And the key idea to improve the analysis is to investigate a new continuity or covering property of the PML distributions. And we apply the chaining technique to obtain a good upper bound. Okay, so that concludes the part one. Uh, any questions so far? Or I can. Uh, Yan Jun, mm -hmm. um, do any of these results carry over to? sort of uh, practical approximations of the um, profile maximum likelihood? Uh, yes. So, ba so basically, yeah, if we have a beta approximated PML, where beta is the approximation factor for the approximated PML, then the competitive factor will be exactly that factor divided by beta. So basically, the, yeah, the argument also carries over to approximated PML distributions. So it is practical. Thank you. Okay, perhaps we could move on to the second part. That is on the high accuracy limitation of the PML. The material of this part could be found in the following paper, also available on archive. So the motivating question for this part is, to, is that whether our previous analysis of PML is tight, including the threshold, n to the minus one third, or the competitive factor e to the n to the one third plus uh, any small constant. So to answer this question, actually, we ask an even broader question. That is, is there any avoid, unavoidable price to pay for adaptation in fun symmetric functional estimation problem? The main motivation for the broader question is that we observe very, uh, we observe a a similar analogy between the local movement matching technique and the PML because in, for both methods, the same threshold is required, is required. And also, both estimators is a optimal estimator for the sorted distribution. So, when, 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 so that motivates us to ask an even broader question. Maybe it is easier to prove a general lower bound for adaptation rather than arguing the lower bound for the PML. So to investigate this question, we consider, we study the following notion called the adaptive minimus risk. So in this case, in this notation, the learner aims to find a single estimator p hat, such that the expected L1 error of the plug-in p hat will be small for any dis hidden distribution supported on k elements, and also for any functional inside some class of functionals. So to specify what is the class of functional, we will consider f to be the set of all one liberty functionals, meaning that the little function f will be one liberty in this scenario. So this is called the minimum adaptive minimum risk. And we, it might be better understood if we relate this quantity to some other known quantities before. So we first consider a smaller quantity. That is, the, we swap the order of the inf and the sup so because the maximum is no more than min max, so this is indeed a smaller quantity. The practical meaning of this quantity is, is essentially that the non-adaptive non minimax risk of, of symmetric estimation. In other words, in this formulation, the learner first knows 
what is the what is the property, and then figure out an estimate estimator, optimal estimator to do that. So in this non-adaptive case, it could be shown that the minimum stress is at all is always root k by n log n, as long as k is much greater than log n and much smaller than n times log n. Okay, so this is a non-adaptive minimum risk, which is a smaller quantity. And there is also a larger quantity where we remove, we move the supremum inside the expectation. And the practical meaning of this part is that the supremum evaluated in the inside the expectation is exactly the sorted L1 distance between P hat and P. So, it mean, so basically, we are looking at a harder problem that is to estimate the sorted distribution. And it turns out that this problem exhibits a elbow effect on the minimum rate. So basically, when k is large, the minimum rate is the same as the previous one. But when k is small, at the threshold n to the power one third, the minimum rate will become the root k by n, which is essentially the performance of the empirical distribution. OK. Now we know a smaller quantity and also a larger quantity. And we know and we must know that our target adaptive minimum risk should lie between them. And the final answer is that the minimax adaptive risk is the same as the larger quantity. It the, has the same difficulty as estimating the sorted distribution. Although here, actually, we for technical reasons, we have some need some mild technical conditions on the S beta P hat. But the, we, yeah, but this has been satisfied by both the local memory matching and the PML. And also we conjecture that this condition could be removed. Okay, now to appreciate this result, this is simply shows that the adaptive minimum risk also exhibits an elbow effect in this scenario. So when k is much greater than n to the minus n to the one third, actually this result means that the adaptive minimum risk is the same as the non-adaptive minimum risk, meaning that here we could achieve fully optimality, yeah, fully adaptivity without paying a price. However, when k is small, when k is smaller than n to the one third, or equivalently when epsilon is smaller than n to the minus one third, the adaptive minimum risk will be strictly larger than the non-adaptive one. Meaning that here we need to have pay a strict price of adaptation in this scenario for general adaptive procedures. The, the uh, direct corollary on the PML is as follows. That is, the, our previous competitive analysis, our previous fact, competitive factor in the competitive analysis is actually type. Meaning that that factor e to the power of n to the one third plus c actually cannot be improved to e to the power of n to the mi one third minus c in general. This is very easy to be seen because if such an improvement was possible, then we would have, then the PML plugging approach would have been adaptively optimal for some accuracy parameter epsilon much smaller than n to the minus one third, which is a contradiction to the previous theorem. So this also, we are also shows that the optimality requirement epsilon much greater than n to the minus of one third for PML is actually not superfluous, but is a natural constraint and actually an essential constraint for this problem. And finally, we also need to be cautious in interpreting this result. So specifically, although this result rules out the possibility that the PML could be fully up, could, could be fully optimal for all functionals, but it does not rule about the probability rule out the possibility that PML could be fully optimal for some given functional. So, so basically, if, if, I have a give, yeah, if I have a given functional, then PML still, could still be fully optimal. And that is a very interesting future question. And to argue that, one essentially need to get rid of the previous competitive analysis type of argument, because we have already shown that the general analysis could not be improved in that scenario. So that question will be very interesting. We will also compare our adaptive minimum risk by, with the traditional adaptive estimation appearing in the statistics literature. So basically, let's first recall what is the general minimum formulation in the statistical decision theory. So basically, yeah, in statistical decision theory, we will have an unknown parameter set theta and also a log function L. And the minimax estimator aims to find an estimator t such to minimize the worst case expected loss occurred by that function, that estimator t. 
And then what is the adaptive estimation? So many past work in statistics consider the problem of adapting to a nested class of parameter sets, theta one containing theta two and so on, where the target is to find a single estimate t such that the worst case performance of t in theta m is close to the optimal minimized estimate restricted to parameter set theta m. So basically, statisticians are interested in, in this ratio. So if we could show a uniformly small constant on the a small upper bound on this ratio, then the then this adapt, uh, adaptive estimation problem could be solved without paying a too much price. For example, in density non-parametric density estimation with a global loss and also with different smooth parameters, it could be shown that this quantity is upper bounded by a constant, meaning that there is essentially no price to pay for adaptation. As another example, so just for the same problem, for density estimation problem, but at just as a point, the loss function is at a point and still with the different smooth parameters, then people could show that yeah, this quantity is lower bounded by some logarithmic factor going to infinity, meaning that there will be a strict price to pay for adaptation in that scenario. However, our work actually has a different framework. That is, we are not aiming to adapt to a class of parameter sets, but a class of loss functions. So basically, our target is to find a single estimate that minimize the worst case expected loss, where the worst case is taken over the parameter theta inside the capital theta and also a loss function in L. And to see why our problem relates to this case, the loss function L of F is just defined to the difference between the plug-in approach of the Q distribution and the plug-in approach of the estimated distribution. And our lot class of loss functions is essentially the class of loss functions, is the set of loss functions where F is a one Lipschitz functional. So yeah, our adaptive estimation problem is different and we aim to adapt to different loss functions. And then what is the idea, what is the proof idea to show an adaptation lower bound in this scenario? Know that many well known tools, such like the constraint risk inequality, which works well for the previous simulation, will not work for us. And to do that, let's yeah, recall what is the high level idea to improving non adaptive minimized risk. The main argument is goes through the traditional hypothesis testing argument. That is, we'd like to find a final subset, theta, theta 1 to theta m, inside the parameter theta such that the following two conditions hold. The first condition is the separation condition. That is, for every pair, distinct pair i and j, every single action will not incur a uniformly small loss under both theta i and theta j. So there is a minimum separation gap called the delta in here. Basically, this just means that, okay, if we misclassify the theta i, then we are, we are, we will almost surely obtain a very large loss. And the another condition is the indistinguishability condition. That is, based on the observations the learners have, the learners can actually, can, could not actually distinguish between the individual theta i's. Meaning that actually there is a constant probability of error that the learner will make in deciding which theta i. So compare, combining with the separation condition, this translates to some lower bound on the minimum estimation error. And then how about the adaptive minimized risk? The only difference is that in addition to finding theta one to theta m in the parameter set, we also aim to find different loss functions, L1 to Lm in the loss set with the same indistinguishability condition. Actually, the introduction of the new loss functions does not affect that condition, but with a new separation condition. That is, the loss at the environment i is also measured using Li not using the same loss function L. So basically for each I, we'll associate a non-parameter theta I and also a new loss function L I, such that a new separation condition could hold under this scenario. And by choosing appropriate theta I's and L I's, we could arrive at the final adaptation lower bound shown in the previous main theorem. And to conclude part two, in this part, we show that Epsilon much greater than n to the power minus one third is a lower bound for general adaptive approaches to be optimal. 
Yeah, this result also implies a tight lower bound analysis of the PML and also a strictly larger adaptive minimus risk for functional estimation. That is, we it's a strict price to pay for adaptation when epsilon is very small. So to conclude, in this talk, we studied the tight optimality and the limitation of the PML plugin approach. Well, for the optimality part, we improve this upper bound threshold from n to the minus a quarter to n to the minus one third. And for the limitation or the lower bound part, we prove a no novel epsilon much greater than n to the minus one third lower bound for general adaptive approaches. Thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Yandru. Are there any questions? Uh, yeah, Yandru, uh, I just wanted to comment mm -hmm. on Saki's question. Uh, sure. Uh, Saki, as uh, Yanjun mentioned, uh, the first uh, part of the talk, the result holds for e to the n to the one third approximate PML as well. But uh, right now we don't have an algorithm to compute a distribution which which has this approximation guarantee. That question is still open. I see. What makes it difficult? So, uh, at some point, uh, actually, there are root n constraints, and uh, so uh, when there is in in this efficient computation of PML, you need to do some sort of rounding algorithm. Since there are these root n constraints, it becomes a slightly difficult to round this solution in a better way. Mm -hmm. So uh, basically I'm trying, uh, the integrality gap of the convex optimization problem might be very bad because there are very huge number of constraints. Mm -hmm. That's the rough intuition, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Kira. So, any more, any other questions? Or oh, I'm happy to take any offline questions here yeah, through email. Yanjin, uh, I was wondering this among this local moment matching method you have uh -huh. and PML. Uh, so, the, you write some sort of a convex optimization problem even in local yes. moment matching method. Right? Uh, yes, a linear programming actually. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. In, yeah. in this, I see. see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I, I think the it can be. Yeah, yeah, the previous LM local model matching approach requires a solution of a convex problem, but yeah. the new approach actually only requires solving a linear problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice.